God's people don't act that way. Now, those weren't James' exact words, but they could certainly be summarized as such. James 2, beginning in verse 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. Those that have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ are those that follow after the faith of Christ, those that have submitted to the gospel system of faith, those who claim to be Christians, those who are God's people. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't claim to follow Jesus with respect to persons. Now that doesn't mean don't act respectfully toward people. The word translated with respect to persons means to be a face looker, one that focuses on the face, the physical, the superficial, the outward. The English standard translates it with partiality. God's people don't act that way. Those who follow Christ, the Lord of glory, the one who is deity, the one who showed no respect of persons, the one who was not a face looker, those who follow him do not exhibit the very characteristics that he refused to portray. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality, with face looking, with externals, with superficiality, with respect to persons, racism, bias. Prejudice. Prejudice. Pre-judging. That's what they all are. In fact, throughout this section of James chapter 2, the idea of judging and judging with unwarranted conclusions stands prominent. God's people don't act that way. The world does. We live in a world that is propagating bias and prejudice. We hear tell of racism and reverse racism. We hear tell of sexism and reverse sexism. We hear of various kinds of prejudices, and somehow we've got it in our heads that there's an example of reverse prejudice, which reverse prejudice is simply prejudice exhibited in the the manner that might not be as common in our minds as others, but it's still prejudice. (laughs) There's nothing reverse about it. Racism, bias, prejudice, prejudging. Proverbs 18, 13. Solomon would say, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. We're going to put this in plain and simple terms. The one that answers a matter before he hears it. In other words, he's arriving at conclusions that are unwarranted by the evidence. And if we will apply that, especially to the way that we treat people, the one that practices prejudice toward people, it is folly and shame unto him. He's a shameful idiot. Did you hear that? To engage in any form of prejudice is shameful idiocy. Factors of race, shameful. But what about those that exercise a form of prejudice or bias based on nationality? Based on age, gender? What about marital status? Are there ever situations where, where, where people will exhibit a certain prejudice based on someone's marital status? What about whether or not you're a parent? The world will act this way. God's people must not. Christians, when you are engaging with those of varied races and nationalities and and genders and age backgrounds and marital statuses. When you are engaging with the world, 
And there is an area of distinction that the world can identify and can in any way try to exclude you. The world's going to do it because that's how the world acts. Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respect to persons, Christians, God's people don't act that way. It ought not surprise us when we see bigotry and bias in the lost world around us. It ought to break our hearts when it takes place among God's people and the way they treat one another. Which means it is incumbent upon us to be careful because we, being human, we, being people who dwell in a society that bombards us with the society's mentalities, we are susceptible to the very behavior that God's people don't pursue. So, those thoughts conveyed, let's turn our attention to James 2. And consider what James has to say about this idea of prejudice. And as we move through the first 13 uh, verses of James 2, we want to keep in mind that this idea regarding prejudice, is there... Is there a place for application of this regarding race relations? Absolutely. But brethren, if we limit it to that, we've missed it. Because as James deals with the concept of partiality, at no point does he say black, white, Cuban, or Asian. But he does talk about those that would discriminate on the basis of economic status, social status, Oh, there are so many lines of demarcation that people will draw to try to differentiate themselves, distinguish themselves from others and excluding others to their own exaltation. We understand that there are different roles for some to fill. The roles for the husband in the home are different for the roles of the wife in the home. See Genesis 2, 1 Timothy 2 and so forth, Ephesians 5. The the roles for certain within the church based on their age and experience is going to be different than the roles for certain others. See, qualifications for elders. Yes, there are distinctions that heaven has delivered that we are to respect. At the same time, that's not face-looking. There's a difference between needlessly and blindly judging a book by its cover and properly recognizing a uniform. You take a soldier at war and he comes into contact with a combatant from the other side. Well, if he decides he needs to engage in a brief conversation just to see how this person feels about the nature of the conflict, there's a good chance he's not walking away. Yes, there's a case to be made that there are times we need to recognize the uniform of the enemy. The Proverbs writer hit on that idea, Proverbs 7.10, when he spoke of the woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. There are some that may be the enemy and they don't know any better. But yes, there's something to be said about having a a watchful eye and, and making discernment, please understand, not discrimination in the negative sense of the word, but discernment based on how people will choose to present themselves, choose to behave. But it's far different to make pre judged decisions based on characteristics and traits that are beyond a person's control or that are not necessarily negative traits. Color, economic status, nationality, age, gender, marital status, parenthood or absence of children. All of these are traits that ought never be discriminated against. So what does James have to say about this idea of showing partiality? Well, first, when we talk about this idea of partiality and prejudice, prejudice indicates evil judgments. Judgments that are not properly warranted and therefore are in direct contradiction to what is good. James 2, beginning in verse 2. 
He says to the brethren, if there come unto your assembly, the word translated assembly is the Greek word synagogue. We get synagogue from it. James, writing in the early decades of the first century, uses terminology that's going to connect to his audience. Remember, he's writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. He's writing to Christians of a Hebrew background, and he is using very Hebrew terms, and he is going to hit on some very Hebrew ideas because they are very Hebrew in their thinking. If they come unto your assembly, your synagogue, your gathering place, he's talking about the church, but he's talking to Christians primarily of a Hebrew background. If they come unto your assembly, a gold, man with a gold ring, and in goodly apparel, here comes a visitor. Now we know not if this visitor is a Christian or a non-Christian. James does not specify, could be either one. If there come to your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, there come also a poor man in vile raiment. Let's hit the pause button. Whereas it is the case that Paul would warn Christians about dressing in a modest manner. Particularly spoke of the women adorning themselves with modest apparel, 1 Timothy 2, 9 and following. But the idea of modesty and letting our adornment being the inward man of the heart and not the outward person, it applies whether male or female. But isn't it interesting that James does not chastise the man with the gold ring and the goodly apparel for being overdressed? James says, there comes unto your assembly a, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel. There comes also a poor man in vile raiment. Yes, there's a case to be made from Matthew 20 and Jesus' illustration of the wedding feast. There was one to whom the master came and said, why are you here without a wedding garment? But keep in mind, Jesus' parable was an illustration of deity judging the guests at the wedding. And last time I checked, we ain't deity. So when we think about this one that James is describing who arrives in vile raiment, it's not that he showed up to the wedding feast without a wedding garment. We can make an assumption. The rich man, for whatever reason, whether his motives are positive or not, he's there wearing the best he's got. The poor man in vile raiment, for whatever reason, whatever his motives, he's there wearing the best available. Neither the rich man nor the poor man, in what James has to say, are chastised for their attire. What James challenges is the way that Christians react to the outward appearance of others. There come unto your assembly a, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel. There comes also a poor man in vile raiment. And you say unto the, he, him that hath the gay clothing, sit thou here in a good place. You say concerning the man and the, the goodly apparel, hey, you can sit by me. I, I, I want to keep company with you. At this point, it may well have been the case that in the, the Christian meeting places, they were arranged much like the synagogues. In the synagogues, the, the best seat was the furthest east at the end of the row, closest to Jerusalem, typically speaking. In the gathering places of early Christians of a Hebrew background, based on what James says here, they may well have had this mindset of, my seat's a ranking seat. You can sit by me and be moved up to my status level. There's a mindset there that needs to caution us today. And that's the mindset of, status within the church we need to appreciate roles but we all have the status of sinners become saints we all have the status of lost become saved we all have the status of lambs following the shepherds who serve the chief shepherd that's our status our roles they may vary based on different distinctions and qualifications but our status we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. James says, there comes to this assembly, these two men. And you tell the man in the gay clothing, sit out here in a good place. But you tell the poor, you sit down over there. It's not hard to imagine, is it? Vile raiment doesn't typically come with cologne and perfume. 
Vile raiment is typically vile because of so many stains from sweat and oil and dirt and mud and muck and whatever else may have come into contact with that garment. Frequently things that have odor. You sit over there so I don't have to smell you. Or here, you can sit under my footstool. A lowered seat. A, 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 a station below the feet of this one sitting higher. Simply based on outward circumstances. Simply based on attire. That's prejudice. The behavior taking place that James, James described in James 2 would be no different than brethren coming to worship and on one side you've got the Caucasians and on the other side you've got the African Americans or the minorities in general. Nor would it be any different than so many congregations where it's pro predominantly another ethnicity and not Caucasian. Where if you go and visit there, you're going to be treated like a minority by people who have a chip on the shoulder because they see themselves as a minority, except for in this situation we're the majority and now we're going to flex our muscles. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory, with respect to persons, there's no place for it. It's evil. Here, James, verse 4, Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Partial, diakrinos, you're prejudging. You are judging thoroughly in an evil way. Judges of evil thoughts. To render a decision of what a person must be thinking or, or the moral standing of a person based on mere outward circumstances is as foolish as determining the dollar value of a gift based solely upon the wrapping paper on the outside of the box. There's been many a valuable gift conveyed in some basic brown wrapping paper and many a plastic piece of invaluable jewelry, if you will, are wrapped up awful pretty. There have been many people who were diamonds in the rough and others who looked like diamonds, but all they were was rough. Brethren, James' point is this. We don't judge books by the cover. Especially when we're talking about those circumstances that are beyond the control of people. And when we first met an individual regarding outward appearance, we have no determination whether or not even that vile raiment is the person's choosing or the result of poor decisions, something he's done for himself or something he's chosen to do. He's just a person. We move forward. Prejudice indicates evil judgment. It did then, it does now. So if we, if we distinguish and differentiate based on these outward circumstances, think about what we can be doing. What would it do to a, a church that exhibited the kind of behavior that James was describing where the brethren are divided based on their attire or the cost of their array? You've got the, you, the high-end uh, department store shoppers on one side. You've got the Walmart, Walmart Target shoppers in the middle. And then on the other end, you've got the folks that shop at Goodwill. By the way, you can find some awfully nice stuff at Goodwill. You might even be able to go over the other side when folks don't know where you got it. Which conveys the illogical approach of trying to judge a book by the cover. If we were to follow the same pattern that they did today, there'd be congregations where you've got a black church on one corner and a white one on another. Oh, did I say that out loud? Are we allowed to talk about that? You might find situations where you've got a, a more affluent congregation on one street and a more salt-of-the-earth congregation just two streets away. Because this one group just, uh, they don't want to 
fraternize with, with those that are of a lower economic status. God's people don't act that way. Prejudice, whether it be based on complexion or income or any other of these characteristics, indicates evil judgments. Prejudice, picking up at verse 5, ignores God's judgment. James will actually make the point, James 2, picking up at verse 5, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the, uh, the kingdom which He hath promised to them that love Him? God's made a choice. God's made a decision and rendered a judgment. And God has declared that there are those that are poor that can indeed be rich in faith. You think back to what Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There are not many noble, not many mighty, Oh, you think about Christ's words. When He declared the humility that would characterize His people, a spiritual humility, yes, but it was still nonetheless a shock to the ears of those who thought that acceptance with God and physical wealth went hand in hand. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the what? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Any sort of poor in the mind of a Hebrew was a bad thing. James has the audacity, the courage, and the confidence in God to say, God has chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that He promised to them that love Him. We need to remember the same thing. Maybe the line of demarcation is not the dollars. Maybe it's the education level. Do you realize Jesus is able to save the uneducated just as well as He's able to save the, those with PhDs? Maybe the line of demarcation is the nationality. He can save an American as easily as He can save an Ethiopian and vice versa. Maybe the line of demarcation in the mind is gender. Maybe the line of demarcation is whether or not you live north or south of the Mason-Dixon line. Maybe the line of demarcation is accent. <laughs> Remember Acts chapter 2? Are not all these which speak Galileans? They could tell by the accent that the ones that Jesus, those who Jesus was using were Galileans of all the people. It'd be about like hearing Tennesseans preach. It's not going to be a matter of affluence. Their accent. And if Jesus can save them all, ought we not value them all? God has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which He's promised to them that love Him. But, verse 6, but you've despised the poor. Here's the mindset of Christians. And in this case, where they're differentiating based upon income and economic status, you've despised the poor. You've looked down your noses. And the word translated despise comes with a tense and tone that carries the idea of a constant and continued behavior. You have continually despised the poor. This is your mode of conduct. This is your habit. This is your routine. This is who you are. God has chosen the poor of this world, but you've looked down your noses at them, James says. Brethren, are there any toward whom any of us look with an automatic air of superiority? Despising their perceived inferiority. Are there any to whom our eyes look with disdain simply because they were born into different circumstances, simply because they, they were born with different complexions, simply because they were born with a different mode of communication. Prejudice, bias, partiality, shameless idiocy. You have despised the poor. 
God has chosen them and you've despised them, James says to his audience. They've ignored God's judgment, God's acceptance, God's mindset, and instead they're too busy reflecting a very carnal and materialistic one, which goes in sharp contrast to everything that's been exhibited by the very people to whom they're giving a, a, a bit of commendation. Because James says, do not the rich men draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they oppress you? Aren't you being mistreated by these rich men? This was at a day and age where people would be in prison because of debts. Uh, uh, these that you, to whom you're, you're trying to kiss up, these uh, the, that you're trying to gloss and glorify, are not they the very ones that are mistreating you, drawing you before the judgment seats? James 2, picking up at verse 7, Don't they blaspheme that worthy name by which you're called? That worthy name is Christian. And this was a situation where God's people were glorifying those that blasphemed Christ. Thereby blaspheming Christ's people. But here were Christians that would rather embrace and show deference to those who had demonstrated themselves to be the enemy. And they'd shown disdain toward those that needed a friend. Have we ever done that? Have we ever, forgot, ever forgotten who we are? Have we ever chosen to embrace those that blaspheme the worthy name by which we are called because they have more outward similarities to us. And we want to identify those that have the same complexion, our, our race, or those that are from Alabama or Tennessee. We, we want to identify with those that are country or city. We want to identify with those that are American. If your identity begins with anything other than Christian, then could it be the case that you don't know who you are or ought to be? Because God's people don't act that way. When I'm an American Christian, or a Republican Christian, or a Democratic Christian, or a country Christian, or a city Christian, or a southern Christian, or a northern Christian, or a liberal Christian, or a conservative Christian. When I'm anything other than a Christian, I might be a Christian who's from the southern part of the U.S., a Christian who, who lives in a, a suburban or a rural environment. First and foremost, we're to be Christians. And when we are first and foremost Christians, then we will first and foremost look at people through Christian eyes instead of these other, these other goggles of distinction. Prejudice indicates evil judgment. Prejudice ignores God's judgment. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to every American that believeth. Every Caucasian that believeth, every African American that believeth, the power of God unto salvation to every wealthy man that believeth, to every pauper that believeth, to every male that believeth, every female that believeth. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. Jew first, also the Greek. Paul's dealing with prejudice when he writes the book of Romans and emphasizes the universality of the gospel. The blood that saved us saves them. The blood that saved them saves us. And so, it's not just a matter of how we're looking at them. How are we looking at Him? And how are we letting our perspective of Him change how we see the world around us, and each other. James' audience had ignored God's judgments. And as a result, 
they were judging others wrongly. Prejudice indicates evil judgments. Prejudice ignores God's judgments. And finally, prejudice invites strict judgment. James 2, picking up at verse 8, James would say, If you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, thou doest well. Here's the law of the Scripture. Here's what was taught in the Old Testament, Leviticus 19, 18. Here's what Jesus had to say, John 13. Here's what's still taught by God's people today. See, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 John 4, love one another. If you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou doest well, but if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin. And are convinced that it is convicted of the law as transgressors. For he that said, Thou shalt not kill, said also, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, if thou commit not adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. In other words, when you violate one law, you violate the entirety of the law. The uh, person doesn't have to commit adultery and murder in order to violate the law. Breaking either of those is a violation. James would go on to say, verse 12, So speak ye, and so do, as they shall, that shall be judged by the law of liberty. The law of Moses taught the Hebrews love one another. The law of Jesus teaches us not love thy neighbor as thyself, but as I have loved you, so love you one another. John 13. We're taught to love one another by a remarkable standard. So speak ye, and so do, because we're going to be judged by the law of liberty. What's the law of liberty? It's the law of Christ. James would speak of the law, or Paul rather would speak of the law of liberty in writing to the Galatians. And then he would say, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. The law of liberty is the law of Christ. It's the faith of Christ. And you can't have the faith of Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons because God's people don't act that way. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. He shall have judgment without mercy, that has shown no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Mercy, judgment, put in contradistinction to one another, not because they contradict, but because that there is a correlation between the two. And if we know who our God is, we'll know which one has the first opportunity to be accepted. James' words here hearken back to Exodus 34. When Moses had petitioned with God, show me thy glory. And God, who had already appeared to Moses in the burning bush, whose law Moses already knew, whose power Moses had already seen in the plagues, Moses still said, I want to know you. And when God passed by, Exodus 34, beginning in verse 5, Moses is hidden in the cleft of the rock because no man can see God's face and live. When God passed by, hear the description that does not stress His power. It doesn't stress His righteousness, so to speak. The description that God gives of Himself pertains to how God treats man. Exodus 34, beginning in verse 5, the Lord passed by and declared His name, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful. The first trait described is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness. The word translated goodness, kased, could well be translated mercy. It's the idea of loving kindness. Abundant in goodness and truth, fidelity, faithfulness. Exodus 34, 7, keeping mercy. The word translated mercy at the beginning of Exodus 34, 7 is kased. The same word goodness in the previous verse. Merciful. Abundant in mercy, loving kindness. Keeping, protecting mercy, loving kindness. For thousands, he guards the relationship. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin will by no means clear the guilty. Will by no means clear the guilty. Will by no means clear the guilty. Guilty indicates recognizing fault. There's a difference between good and guilty. Remember what James had said earlier, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you shall do well. That's good. 
But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convicted, you're guilty. We can either be good or guilty. God, in describing Himself, described Himself first as merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving inequity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty. There's judgment. He starts with mercy. He ends with judgment. No wonder mercy rejoices against judgment because mercy takes advantage of the kind, generous, benevolent, gracious aspects of God that He makes available before we render ourselves subject to His judgment. Partial in yourselves? That's prejudging. He shall have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy. It's because of prejudging. Saints, how judgmental are we? How often are we rendering judgments that aren't warranted by the evidence? Judging books without even looking at the cover, let alone considering the content. He shall have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy. Thus a conclusion can be reached. When we refuse to treat people the way God treats people, we refuse God's merciful treatment of us. Prejudice invites strict judgment. So now, the question comes to each of us. We have a Savior who shed His blood for all. Both Jew and Greek, as Paul would put it to the Romans. When he wrote to the Galatians, he said, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, but Christ is all and in all, Galatians 3.28. The gospel is for all. Salvation is for you. Whatever the distinguishing characteristics of you may be that make you an individual, your identity is first and foremost to be Christian. The question that's before you is, is it? Before we judge anyone else, let's each of us judge ourselves. It might be the case this afternoon that you're someone who's obeyed the gospel. But it's time to judge self and repent. Make things right. Repent of the way you've treated others and ultimately the way you've treated God because of it. It might be the case that you're, you're here this afternoon and you've never judged Jesus as worth following. And it's time to render submission. It's time to decide I'm going to die with Christ and be raised to walk with Him in newness of life. I'm going to declare I believe He's the Son of God. I know He died. I know He rose. And I want to repent so that I can be washed in the blood of the Lamb by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to be added without reservation by Jesus Christ Himself to the church that He shed His blood to save? You can do it. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation without prejudice, without bias, why not take the opportunity while we stand and while we sing?